All right, good afternoon, everybody. Quite a lot to get through today. So shortly I'll hand over to Dr. McElnay, who will give an update on today's cases. Uh, I will then provide an update on alert level boundaries uh, and a bit more information around vaccines and an update on vaccines. I'll then uh, take, we'll then open up for questions and at about half past one, we'll hand over to Dr. Verrill and Professor David Murdoch, who will be providing more of an update on testing. So uh, Dr. McElnay, we'll hand over to you to kick off. Thank you, Minister, and kia ora koutou katoa. There are 29 new cases of COVID-19 in the community to report today. 24 of these cases are in the Auckland region and five are in the Waikato. That brings the total for Waikato to 22. One previously reported community case has been reclassified as under investigation and removed from the overall outbreak tally. This takes our total cases in this outbreak to 1,448. There are also two cases to report in recent returnees in our managed isolation facilities. Of today's 24 cases in Auckland, seven are yet to be linked to, the current, to a current case and interviews are ongoing. All of the Waikato cases are linked. Of yesterday's 39 cases reported, only one Auckland case remains unlinked at this point with investigations ongoing. There are 10 active subclusters in Auckland where there have been recent cases. This has dropped from 12 yesterday. Two previously active subclusters are now classified as dormant, which means they haven't had an active case outside a household contact for 14 days, and that's encouraging. For hospitalizations, there are 23 people in hospital with COVID-19, four of which are in ICU or a high dependency ward. This is a significant drop from the 32 in hospital yesterday, with nine people now discharged. For those still in hospital, this is a stressful time for them and their families, and our thoughts are with them. On testing, we continue to see high testing rates with 23,387 swabs processed throughout the country. In Auckland yesterday, there were 12,757 swabs taken across the city. Over 2,800 of these tests were from our eight suburbs of interest. And we're still encouraging anyone living in those suburbs to get tested to give us the assurance that there isn't undetected COVID in those communities. We've seen an excellent response from our latest suburb of interest, Red Beach. And in the last two days, over 1,200 people in this suburb have been tested. In Auckland, today there are 22 community testing centres open. This includes 16 pop-ups. Four of the community testing centres are operating extended hours in Wirri, Northcote, Balmoral and Otara to improve access for essential and permitted workers. There are seven pop-up testing sites in the Waikato, and they are in Hamilton, Katapiro, Raglan, Huntley, Kaifia, and Tukuroa. Anyone with symptoms um, should get a test. And yesterday, I can report, there were 6,480 tests taken across the Waikato. And just some further information on the exposure event that we um, announced yesterday at the emergency department at Waikato Hospital. Uh, all ED staff and staff who visited the ED have been tested for COVID-19. All 50 ED staff have returned negative tests. Most have been cleared to return to work. There are six ED staff who have been identified as close contacts. And while they have all returned a negative test, the level of contact they had with the case means that they are required to self-isolate for 14 days with additional testing. Of the staff who visited ED at the same time as the case, 30 have returned negative tests and a further 22 tests are still to be processed. They all relate to staff who are considered casual contacts only and we expect those results this afternoon. And just lastly, uh, today the Auckland City Mission will be named as a location of interest after a person who received services from their city centre site tested positive for COVID-19. The person visited the centre on the morning of October the 4th, but the risk to the public 
is considered to be low. The person was outside in a tent for testing and also queued in the open air for a meal pack. Everyone who visits the mission is required to wear a mask and stay two metres apart. Many visitors to the mission are vulnerable and have complex needs and staff are working with Auckland Regional Public Health Service to ensure the safety and well-being of its clients and visitors. The mission team is contacting as many people who receive services at the site as they can to encourage the uptake of testing and to check on their health status. And staff at the mission also undergo regular surveillance testing. Back to you, Minister. Thank you, Dr McElwain. While it's encouraging that all of the cases so far in the Waikato are linked, I did indicate yesterday that we would be keeping the boundary uh, around the Waikato area that is currently at Alert Level 3 under review uh, and that we would make further decisions on that following, uh, following taking public health advice. That was following yesterday's uh, news that we saw a couple of cases emerging that are outside of the existing Alert Level 3 boundary. This morning, Ministers have considered the public health advice uh, and out of an abundance of caution, uh, we have decided to extend the boundary further south. The extension will cover the Waitomo district, including Tikuiti, uh, as well as Waipa and the Otorohonga districts. That means that the boundary will follow the coast south to Mokau and then east along the northern uh, Puriora Forest Park uh, and then uh, north to include Te Awamutu, Karapiro and Cambridge, where it will meet the existing boundary. A map will be published on the Unite Against COVID-19 website very soon. These areas will now come under the same Alert Level 3 restrictions from 11.59pm tonight uh, as the rest of the uh, Waikato area that is currently covered by Alert Level 3. It is the conventional Alert Level 3 that everyone is familiar with. The easing of steps in Auckland that we announced uh, this week will not apply to this area. The Level 3 restrictions will apply until, at this point, until 11.59pm on Monday night, uh, so that they can be reviewed by Cabinet on Monday. During the next four days, we'll be aiming for wide testing, contact tracing, and we will also have further wastewater testing in this area, and that will help us to make an assessment on how long these restrictions need to remain in place for. This extended boundary will include the Hamilton Airport and restrictions on travel by air will be in place, which means that uh, people will only be able to travel for limited, permitted reasons and most uh, of those travelling will require a COVID-19 test. Travel in and out of the area by road will also be restricted, although we are aware uh, that this, this is more challenging uh, than it is in Auckland. Uh, there are a much greater number of roads in and out of the area uh, and so we will be make, asking people to comply with the restrictions in place. We're asking people to carry evidence of why they need to travel if they are travelling. Police will be out patrolling, uh, and if the overall message is if you haven't got a good reason to be travelling, if you haven't got a permitted reason to be travelling, please stay home. What we do need is for people in the area uh, to go out and get tested, though, uh, and to get vaccinated. So there'll be pop-up testing centres at Karapiro, uh, and there are testing sites operating across Hamilton, Raglan, Huntley and Tokoroa. Vaccination is the best tool that we have to provide everyone with their individual armour against COVID-19 and to reduce the need for these types of restrictions again in the future. We launched the National Day of Action uh, next Saturday. We launched that yesterday. Uh, the virus is clearly finding the people who are not vaccinated. Only 3% of the cases in our current outbreak uh, have had a vaccine. So my message is please do not wait. Uh, I can assure you that the vaccine is safe and effective, but please, if you're worried about that, do your own research. Look at trusted sources like the Unite Against COVID website uh, or the Ministry of Health website uh, and talk to your health professionals, nurses, doctors uh, and so on. We do know and we are being told that there are people who are still waiting it out uh, to see if COVID-19 will pass them by. Uh, and there is a review in this community, particularly that we've just talked about, uh, that COVID-19 won't reach into rural communities because of their relative isolation. <coughs> that is wrong. COVID-19 will not pass by. Uh, that should be crystal clear by now. So please do not wait to be vaccinated. COVID-19 uh, will affect our rural communities as much as it does our urban communities. Uh, and the best thing that we can all do uh, is get vaccinated. We're also hearing some feedback uh, from people uh, questioning whether they feel comfortable being vaccinated when their children can't be. 
Uh, and whilst I understand the love that parents have for their children in expressing that, uh, my message to them is that the best way you can show that love towards your children is to get yourself vaccinated in order to protect them. While your children, uh, if they're under the age of 12, can't currently be vaccinated, you will be increasing the layer of protection around them uh, if you and if all of the adults who are coming into contact with them are vaccinated. So please uh, show your love for your kids by getting the vaccinations yourself. There are literally uh, tens of thousands of bookings available in coming days on bookmyvaccine.nz. Now happy to open up for questions, Tova. Why didn't you extend the boundary yesterday? Uh, one of the things we have to do is look at where the risk is, uh, look at where the best place to put the boundary is. Uh, we didn't have time to do that uh, yesterday, uh, so we've done that. We're also just, uh, it is a, a, a decision out of an abundance of caution at this point. Um, we're still uh, feeling, uh, the, the evidence suggests that we're still dealing with a relatively contained group of cases, but these communities are very closely uh, linked. So one of the things we do is we look at traffic movements, for example, uh, the patterns of movements between these different communities. Uh, and the, and um, my, the advice that I've had is places like uh, Te Awamutu, for example, there is quite a lot of uh, interaction there, uh, and so uh, that's why we've put the boundary where we have. There was a, um, a Karapiro case, you knew there was a Carthia case, and with respect, that argument seems pretty flimsy, given that when you knew there was a Hamilton case and a Raglan case, you extended the border. One of the things that we have to do is look at where to draw boundaries uh, and what the most appropriate decisions are to take in those situations. More information comes to light all of the time. Uh, but as I said yesterday, everybody in the area, uh, we've been asking them to, to, to be careful and to, to look for symptoms and uh, to make sure they're following the guidance of the public health teams who are doing the contact tracing. And the fact that you didn't extend the boundary yesterday, do you think that could have contributed to the transmission, these, these new cases no. that we've seen in the Waikato? No, not at all. And where are the five new cases from in the Waikato? Dr. Um, I, I, I don't have the details of the five, but from the overall numbers, they will be in Raglan and Hamilton, okay. but so not the inside the lockdown area. They are. The, the, we only have two cases, as reported yesterday, in um, outside of the lockdown area. Well, as far south as Tikuiti, then, because that's well away from Kafia. Yeah, so we did that based on uh, public health advice. So they've spent some time uh, working with the team at DPMC who help us to draw the boundaries and they look at the overall movement between communities. They look at the commuter patterns that, and so on uh, as to where the most appropriate place to draw those boundaries is. Joe. Um, have you managed to find out what the specific number is in terms of those who have been connections who are now part of the cluster? Because there's been some challenging of that by uh, some members of gangs. Look, I'm aware that, that, that there is some debate in there uh, about this. I do just want to say that gang members are not the only ones involved here. There are a lot of other people uh, who have tested positive for COVID-19 who are not uh, in gangs or necessarily associated with gangs. Uh, but there are certainly people who are either in gangs or associated with gangs now involved. Uh, uh, I don't have an absolute number on that. And in some cases, it may be that, it, you know, they're not, a, they're not a member of the gang themselves, but they might be connected with somebody who is, or they might be connected with someone who is connected to someone. Uh, that's the nature of the way COVID-19 spreads. And you haven't put a ring around it and, and sort of established it as a cluster in the same way that you did with the AOG2, for example. Can you see that um, those who are tied up in gangs see that as very discriminatory and very judgy? Um, of them when you were just putting it out there that there is a number but not putting a number on it? Um, no, I, I don't think we're treating them any differently. Uh, the, the way drawing a ring around um, particular events, for example, as we did with the AOG ch uh, cluster, that was because there were particular events that led to that uh, to that distinction. And in this case, there is a, in the Waikato case, there is an event, uh, and that is the reason why we have, a, if you like, a ring around that particular group. I'll do one more, and then I'll come, and then I'll come to Jason. Um, just in terms of the group who say roughly 15, 15 to 20 per cent that are going to potentially be in that um, hesitant or um, anti-vax type group. What work have you done around working out who those types of people are? Because you've obviously targeted work around uh, Māori and Pacifica, but for example, what about uh, young European men who think that this doesn't affect them? Do you know yet where these groups are, who they are, and how you differently need to be targeting them? So later on this afternoon, we'll be releasing... 
uh, information about that shows sort of by suburb uh, the rates of vaccination across the country. And then from that, you can draw a correlation between the demographic characteristics of those neighbourhoods that have higher concentrations of unvaccinated people. And that certainly provides some insight uh, into uh, the sorts of demographics that we're talking about here. But the overall national statistics also tell us that it, it tends to be a younger cohort. Yes, there are more Māori, uh, higher rates of Pacifica people. But I'd, again, I don't want to draw any generalisations uh, here. I don't think that would be fair. We are seeing good uptake of vaccination amongst Māori and Pacific. They just happen to be uh, disproportionately represented in the statistics of people who haven't yet been vaccinated. Uh, one of the things that, you know, and I've just touched on it in my introductory remarks, that we are picking up from the, the, the feedback that we're getting, the research that we're doing, uh, is that it's not necessarily that people are uh, staunchly anti-vaccination. It's just that there's a degree of comfort that they have at the moment that they don't feel they need a vaccination. And uh, my overall message to them... How do you target young European men? I mean, how do you target young European men out and about in the regions who just go, it doesn't affect me, I don't care? How do you target them? Because that's a quite a different response to how you target Māori or Pacifica. And, and that's exactly what I outlined yesterday and the, the importance of this next 10 days where we're asking everyone to be going out and having those conversations. If every... Uh, if, if all of the 80% who have been vaccinated are having those conversations with the people who haven't yet been. Uh, only, only one out of four people who have been vaccinated need to bring one person in who hasn't been vaccinated and we have 100% vaccination. So we need those who have been vaccinated to be having those conversations. We're not going to be able to, as government, reach every one of them, uh, even with paid advertising, even with all that we are doing. That's why we need everybody... Uh, who's part of the, you know, who's part of that, that group who have done the right thing and been vaccinated? We still need them to be having those conversations with those who haven't. Have you got any more games? information as to how COVID spread from Auckland to Waikato? Uh, what I have, I, I don't. Uh, I, I, what I do know, and the feedback that I've had is that it was uh, a person uh, who travelled into Auckland and out again, and it was one person. Uh, but I don't have more details than that. Have you information to suggest that that person was any in any way gang affiliated? I don't have that information, sorry. Is that, no, the, is that the Hamilton Index case, though? Yes, presumably? that's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I follow up on the, um, Joe's questions around the gangs? Mungle, the Waikato Mungle Mob says there is no COVID among gang members in the Waikato. Is that right? Uh, look, I think... I don't want to get around to, to identifying which cases are gang members or associated with gangs or not. I don't actually have that information. The feedback that I have had is that there are people who are associated uh, with gangs involved in, in this, uh, and, and that's about as far as I can go in terms of the information that I have. You're also saying they're not spreading the virus, but do you dispute that? Uh, certainly there would be some uh, evidence to suggest that there has been spread amongst gang networks. Because, like you were saying yesterday, they're not necessarily following all of those alert level rules. That, that's right. Can, can, can you tell us how many more Kiwis are coming into that level three environment with those boundary changes? Uh, sorry, I don't have the population d demographics there. There are some reasonably substantial places being bought in. So Cambridge, clearly, Te Awamutu have, have reasonable sized populations. Yeah, and um, just following up on the um, gangs as well, can you describe how the government is working with the gangs to try and you know, uh, improve the situation? Well, to be clear, this is not the government working with the gangs, it's the frontline people uh, who are dealing with the, the public health teams who are, who are doing the contact tracing. And they will be. And the feedback that I've had consistently from those people on the ground doing the contact tracing is that they are getting a good degree of cooperation, there's a good degree of information sharing about close contacts, about people uh, who could be at risk. Uh, and so uh, we certainly want to maintain that approach. Whilst I understand that for New Zealanders at home, sitting watching this, thinking I'm doing the right thing, I've been vaccinated, I'm following all of the rules, uh, my thanks go very much to you. The focus here is on stamping out COVID-19. I don't have any time for gangs or for the activities that they are engaged with, but that is not the number one priority at this point. The number one priority is identifying people at risk of having contracted COVID-19 and trying to stop the virus in its tracks. That has to be forefront of the activities here. <laughs> um, a little over a week ago, you stood here and said that the National Party's plan would mean that we get COVID for Christmas. How confident are you, given that the board, that the that numbers are sort of hanging in there, that the board is creeping south, that we're not going to get COVID for Christmas anyway? Look, we continue to pursue a strategy of having zero tolerance for COVID-19 cases. Um, a greater movement at the border at this point would almost certainly increase the risk of additional COVID cases spreading into other parts of the country more quickly. Um, but we are, we are in a phase where we have to 
uh, work extra hard uh, in order to try to try and stop the spread of the virus. There's no question about that. So you, you can't guarantee the, that you're not. Is the um, prime minister. Then? Uh, the Prime Minister is up in the Tairawhiti uh, region, stumping for vaccination, helping to get, uh, working to help get our vaccination rates up there. It is one of the parts of the country where we need to do better, uh, and so she's doing some uh, activity up there. Do you think her presence up there will help? Uh, I believe so, yes, and, and I think it will help as well. Sorry, it's one of the she in Rotorua today? Sorry, it's heading uh, sort of late Tairawhiti, yeah, that, that part of the country. I think uh, Rotorua, but then heading across into the Tairawhiti area. We still, have pe uh, we still have doctors peddling misinformation around vaccines, particularly up in Northland, where the DHB has said GPs' anti-vax views are impacting their rollout. Why have those people not been stopped from doing that or even stood down? Does the Medical Council or another body need more teeth to do so? I understand the Medical Council have issued some pretty pretty clear guidance to uh, to members of the medical profession, but it's probably more appropriate for Dr McElnay well, to make that um, comment. I'm aware that the Medical Council has certainly encouraged reports of act activities from doctors to be reported to them. They then follow their processes um, after that, but they certainly do want to be advised of uh, doctors in that situation. When there, so much, that, when there is so much at stake, does it need to be a little bit heftier than guidance? Well, the Medical Council has got strong um, processes that they go through um, in order to um, um, assess the situation, so they have requested that, that people notify uh, the Medical Council. Yeah, 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 do you have an update, um, or do you have any more details around the uh, person who accessed the Auckland City Mission? Uh, given that a lot of homeless people often congregate together, are there any concerns around that? Um, I don't have any more details than what I've shared with you today. Um, certainly, um, the the person is being managed um, by Auckland Regional Public Health, and the we st we want the city mission to continue to operate uh, because, of course, it is providing um, services. But those, as I've outlined, they are being provided in a safe way. Mr. Do you have an update around uh, the addition of Bangai as a, re a reason to allow parents to cross the border? We've had a couple of more whānau come to us to say that that has also been their experience. Sorry, I did ask the team to follow that up, as, as I indicated the other day. I just haven't had the feedback back on that yet, so my apologies. I should have come back to you with an answer on that, yet I haven't yet. Do you think that's a double standard, though, given that during Level 4 and Level 3 lockdown, there was um, Māori customary fishing rights guaranteed, uh, that suffered some backlash, and then the rules were changed. However, this case doesn't seem to be getting any traction. Yeah, look, like I said, look, I just haven't had a chance to get that feedback yet. I have asked for that to be looked at, so I'll, I will come back to you on that. I'm sorry that I haven't done that yet. Derek? Do you have any progress uh, or anything more to say about this um, government was considering mandatory vaccination for the travellers going over the, the boundaries, the Level 3 boundaries, and also for uh, teachers or ECE staff, or is that something that, will, that Cabinet will consider on Monday? On Monday, in terms of vaccination requirements and for the Waikato uh, Level 3 area as opposed to the Auckland Level 3 area, uh, sorry, no, actually, testing requirements for the Waikato Level 3 area, uh, they are the same as for the Auckland Level 3 area, decisions around vaccination. I've just realised you were asking about vaccination, not testing. Our cabinet will consider all of those things on Monday. There haven't got, there haven't got anything hurdles. to add on that. Are there sort of legal hurdles there, or is it simply that you know, if there is a great enough public conference, you can enforce that if you, if you want? Yeah, there's practicality considerations there as well, um, in terms of timing and all of those sorts of things. But um, there wouldn't be a, necessarily be a legal impediment to doing it. One of the key factors is practicality. Uh, Amelia. And, and actually, further to that, um, so workforces and people can prepare and they're not blindsided by this. Can you give an indication of how wide that man mandate is going to be? Is it going to be, obviously, we know teachers, but will it include health workforce or anyone crossing the boundary? So we have been consulting on our health workforce, our frontline health workforce, and as I, I think foreshadowed yesterday, having conversations about exactly where that line should be drawn. So does it include laboratory staff, for example, who are processing samples from, uh, from people and who are actually pretty critical to the overall functioning of the health system? Um, so uh, Cabinet will make the decision about exactly where those kind of lines get drawn on Monday. So, But the two workforces that we'll be considering specifically uh, on Monday are the health workforce and the education workforce. And you've just stressed the importance of every adult who comes into contact with a child being vaccinated. So why then were children sent back to ECE centres when parents had no idea the vaccination threshold of staff 
and no idea the vaccination of the teaching staff? There are other protective measures in place. So for the level three areas where ECE is currently operating, it is limited to, uh, in terms of the group size. There are other protective measures that we've put in place there. Uh, and yes, we'll have more around vaccination and testing to say on that next week. Does the ECE workforce say they were blindsided by being told to go back this week? Do you accept that? One of the things is when you do switch things up a bit and when you change things, uh, that is going to uh, require a bit of adjustment from people. If we had moved from Alert Level 3 to Alert Level 2, for example, in Auckland, they would have had about the same amount of notice that they had, uh, and they would have had to do more in that respect. And so with the stepped down way that we are progressing for Auckland, uh, actually we're asking ECE to do less than if we had moved more quickly. So why did that decision need to be made so quickly? Look, we are aware that, um, you know, I, I want to see kids back in early childhood education. It's good for them, it's good for their welfare, it's good for their well-being, it's good for their parents' well-being often too. Uh, and so uh, we do want to allow that to happen, but we want to allow that to happen in a way that's as safe as possible. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have one more and then I'll come over to this side of the room did for a bit. Did you consult the sector? Uh, no, I don't think we did on that particular um, decision. Why not? Look, there's not necessarily time to consult everybody that's affected by every alert level decision that the government takes. We'll come over here and I'll we'll just look along the back row. If we, could we uh, firstly just get an update on the weak positive in Whangarei reported yesterday? The Northern BHB isn't aware of what the, the new result is. And also just a clarification on rules. Why are dentists allowed to operate in the current rules? and not physios and osteopaths? Uh, so I'll um, um, talk to the um, weak positive that was reported yesterday. Uh, Auckland Regional Public Health are continuing to follow up with that person. Uh, they are an Auckland resident, and um, we're expecting further updates later today. Why well, wasn't it updated last night? Sorry? It was expected to be updated last yes, night. Yes, they've made th they've made contact with the person. There's been some challenges in, in getting hold of that person. Uh, they have made contact and they will be doing further testing. Uh, that was a weak positive and that's our usual protocol. Um, a CT value of, of that sort of range um, can mean a number of things. Could be a historic case, um, maybe a false positive, and so they need to have a repeat swab. So that's what I understand is being arranged. In terms of the um, who's in and who's out, in terms of people who are are able to provide services at different alert levels, I accept that there will always be a nature of, uh, that there will, wherever you draw the line, there will be some people who are on one side of the line and other people who are on the other side of the line. There's no, not necessarily ever, any completely clear, neat, easy way to draw that line. Just going back to the Northland GP, multiple complaints were made to the Medical Council back in May and June about a doctor spreading a 20-minute video speaking about anti being anti-vax and he's still practising and registered. Are you comfortable with that? Look, that is ultimately a matter for the Medical Council, but yes, I would expect that uh, our medical professionals are uh, adhering to the very high standards that they set for themselves as a profession, uh, and that sort of behaviour wouldn't uh, adhere to the standards that they have set for themselves as a profession. Oh, okay. um, I will come down the front here. We're working as hard as we can to make sure that we're providing as much data as we can consistent with privacy laws, uh, and that includes with our, with the whānau order providers, so we have been able to provide them with more information, but ultimately government also has to follow the law here, and there are some laws around what we can and cannot provide. We, we're pushing as hard as we can to provide as much information as we can whilst also adhering to the constraints that exist around people's privacy. In, in Slack committee today, uh, Stuart Smith said that the provisions in the COVID-19 bill that would allow the government to delay local government elections are actually related to the Three Waters reform and, and some of the opposition from councils around that? Utterly, that utterly un incorrect. No, and not at all. Um, and uh, are you able to share the vaccination status of the person who died of COVID-19 yesterday? Uh, I don't have that information. I don't have that information. Um, well, we'll, we'll come over here. Uh, with uh, with the, the, the new boundary in the Waikato, um, is there any risk with it being so large that you will eventually run out of police capacity to enforce these you know, greater and greater boundaries in Auckland down the Waikato? Uh, as I think the Prime Minister said out when she uh, announced the first Waikato boundary, this is a more complex part of the country to have alert level restrictions in place, and it isn't possible, as we do in and out of Auckland at the moment, to have checkpoints on, on, on pretty much every major road, because uh, it's a part of the country that's very, very well networked uh, in terms of roading, uh, and so we do have to rely more on people 
complying. But I'd note that when we were at nationwide alert level four and alert level three across the country, for example, again, same principle applies. We rely on people following the rules. Uh, and we do see that people are, by and large, following the rules. The level of staffing that you require at the checkpoints? Uh, look, th those are ultimately matters for the police and for the Commissioner of Police, but the feedback that we've had from them uh, is that they wouldn't be able to resource a, a road block on every single road. Uh, and so we, when we made those decisions, we, we accepted that reality. Uh, but they will be out patrolling, uh, and so they will be stopping people, uh, but they might not be stopping every single car. And I think whilst you know, in an ideal world you'd have enough resource to do that, we do have to acknowledge that that part of the country uh, there are a lot of roads, uh, and it would be very, very difficult to do to practically do that. Now, I'm going to wrap up in a moment because we do have a, another part to this briefing. But, General, I'll come back to you. Um, on the release of the um, suburbs uh, data of the most and least back suburbs this afternoon, New Zealanders are a competitive bunch. What kind of motivation do you think this will provide to get vaccinated? Uh, look, I think we all want to be part of the, the winning team, uh, and New Zealanders as a team of five million have been part of a, a pretty winning team over the last year. Now we're taking this a bit more local, uh, and so I would encourage everyone to look at those stats uh, and make sure your neighbourhood and your community uh, is getting the highest rates of vaccination that you possibly can. What are your three for the three MPC rugby teams to leave the Auckland region get denied? Uh, I'd have to go back and, and check that one. Sorry, I don't know. I haven't got that one, I haven't got that one with me. Derek, I'll come back to you. Question on behalf of the former Deputy Prime Minister, Winston Peters. Why are we hearing that the government is considering putting the whole of the North Island into Level 3 for masks? Uh, we're not. I just want to follow up on that. The suburb by suburb, uh, Dr Bloomfield's already talked about Northland and Pauraferty. Um, is this kind of like, can we expect door-to-door -door teams to go out there or more like pop-up testing stations? What's the strategy to try and boost those numbers in, in those suburbs? Are you talking about vaccination ac across the country? Yeah, so what we've, what we've indicated is over the next 10 days, we're asking our, our, our civic leaders, our political leaders, our community groups who have good connections in those communities to use that information that we're making publicly available to really target those communities where we need to see an uptick in vaccination rates and use those networks, uh, use the existing tools that are available. Now, political parties do this at election time. We go out and we target groups who haven't, who, who otherwise might not get, get to the polling booth. Uh, civic leaders do, do similar things. But there are community groups who, who have really good, rich connections into those communities, and we're asking them to, to contribute to the nationwide effort as well. So that's why we're putting the information out there, because this isn't just, just going to be uh, about us and about the, the central government. I'm sorry to, 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 to reveal it to everyone in the room, but the majority of those people won't be watching this 1pm uh, briefing, um, and so we have to reach them in other ways. Do you think it would have made, made a difference to allow... Uh, uh, younger Māori and Pacifica, you know, to open the door to vaccination bookings for those cohorts earlier, or do you think they just, uh, it wouldn't have made a difference at all? Ultimately, uh, earlier in the campaign, our focus was on trying to stop COVID getting into those communities in the first place, and we were actually very successful in doing that, uh, and vaccination had played a role there. Uh, as vaccination became, you know, vaccination numbers became more available, we were able to move more quickly to open up the, the vaccines to a, a much greater group of people. Uh, as a transition away getting... from elimination, are DHBs currently exploring ways to house more patients with uh, COVID-19 outside of the hospital system? Uh, they're certainly working on making sure they have the capacity to deal with uh, any increase in COVID-19 cases presenting, uh, and they've been doing that for the last year and a half. Um, and I'm sure, and, and I know that they're stepping up their efforts in that regard. Minister Little's been leading that particular, you know, piece of preparate work around making sure the health system is prepared for increased numbers of COVID cases. Um, but the overall answer to your question is yes. They are doing quite a lot of planning there and, and upskilling of staff, for example, to make sure that if they end up with more people in ICU, that they've got people trained to help uh, step into those roles. So, so, just following up on the, the NPC rugby question, so the, there's an inconsistency because the silver ferns were granted exemptions and these teams weren't, so why would there be a different set of standards? Yeah, I didn't make those decisions. I think the Director General made them, and I, I so I don't know the details of that, that but happy to, happy to follow that up and come back to you. Now, one, I'll just do a couple more quick questions, Joe and then... Uh, Jason and Just we'll a clarification for businesses in Auckland. Uh, yesterday you talked about uh, one person, ten bubbles being allowed to structure things like yoga classes, for etc. Cetera, et cetera. Are businesses able to run mental health, wellbeing, workshop type things with ten of their staff meet in an area which would mean staff members travelling from different 
suburbs, meeting socially distancing and doing some sort of mental wellbeing type activity? If they were following all of the relevant guidelines, um, I'd, I'd go back and check, you know, that that's consistent with the guidelines that we've put out, but I'd say to them as, as long as... People can do things as long as they're following the guidelines that have been put out. It's fine. Uh, I'll take that one away, because you've given a, a particularly specific example there. I'll take it away and I'll come back to you. Our DHB is standing down all staff after COVID exposures, including Auckland Hospital, which is now a location of interest. I'm not quite sure if I understand the, the question. There is existing protocols that the DHBs follow. Should there be a case, it's very case specific. There usually is an initial stand down um, while staff are tested and assessed as um, de degree of contact that they have with the case. And then a number of staff are usually allowed back. Um, a number of staff, as, in, as we've seen in the Waikato, um, may have to stay off for a longer period. So it's hard to give a, a sort of a, a generic answer. I'm not sure of the specifics around Auckland City Hospital. Can you reassure staff concerned about their safety, safety that the DHBs are following the Ministry of Health's advice procedures? Yes, yes, they are. And they work very closely with the local public health unit, wherever that is. And in Auckland, that's Auckland Regional Public Health. OK, you can be lucky last for this round. Do you know why um, there's a doctor in Southlands hospital, Hospital's maternity unit who runs it has been unable to get an emergency MIQ allocation, despite the fact that she's delivering a critical public health service and was visiting terminally ill families? No, I don't um, review the individual applications. One of the things I would say is, I'm looking at the number of health workers that we are needing to get into the country at the moment, and so I'm taking a good close look at that because there's several hundred potential health workers that we uh, that, are, that are currently waiting uh, to see whether there are things that we can do to support that because ultimately we need them in our health workforce. So I'm, I'm looking closely at it, but I, I can't comment on specific individual cases because I don't have the details of those. Right, I'll now hand over to, doc, uh, to Dr Verrill and uh, Professor Murdoch, and they're going to give you an update on testing, and then I'm sure that they will also take your questions. Thanks, everyone. Koto. From the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've used a range of methods to contain and control the virus, to protect lives and our way of life. Right from the beginning, testing, contact tracing and isolating have helped us to quickly find COVID-19, contain it and stamp it out. It is a strategy that has worked well for us to date, with no COVID in our, communi in our communities for a record number of days and a world-leading public health response that has seen very few deaths and hospitalisations compared to most other countries. Testing has been a key part of this response. It has helped us hunt down the virus, put a fence around outbreaks, and stamp out the spread of COVID-19. As one part of the armour, safeguarding our freedoms, testing has been vital in our efforts to protect New Zealanders. A massive amount of testing has been carried out in the current outbreak. Since New Zealand went into lockdown just over seven weeks ago, almost one million PCR tests have been done. Māori and Pacific health providers have been amazing at encouraging their communities to be tested, providing tailor-made initiatives such as pop-up testing centres at convenience lo convenient locations. We've used whole genome sequencing to map in detail every chain of transmission, again to find, to find every case, and also to understand the transmission of COVID-19 so we could prevent future outbreaks. And we have used wastewater testing to help er with the early detection of outbreaks. Our strategy is evolving an increasingly vaccinated uh, population is providing more options for us, and so our toolbox is changing. To date, we have relied heavily on high sensitivity PCR tests because most New until most New Zealanders are protected by vaccinations, the cost of missing a case has been too high for us to rely on tests that cannot provide us with high levels of certainty. As the strategy evolves to one based around high levels of vaccination, where we continue to stamp out COVID-19, our approach to testing can also take, uh, adapt to the new environment. When we are well protected by vaccinations, we can, in certain circumstances, use lower sensitivity tests that provide other benefits, such as accessibility and convenience, so that we detect more cases overall. So the Director of General of Health asked Professor David Murdoch and his team to review the coordination of COVID-19 testing review the processes by which tests and innovations are 
assessed and adopted, and identify opportunities to ensure ongoing, sustainable and fit-for-purpose COVID-19 testing in New Zealand. Professor Murdoch will talk about his team's findings shortly. The review panel acknowledged the huge contribution of laboratories to Aotearoa New Zealand's successful COVID-19 response, while often working under great pressure. I want to thank these teams for their continued efforts to keep New Zealanders safe. One of the key themes in the report we're releasing today is how we adopt and, test, uh, and use testing innovations. Rapid antigen testing is already in use in four approved health programs to assess how suitable it is in the context of New Zealand's COVID-19 prevalence. Auckland hospitals in areas deemed high risk settings are using this technology to detect cases early in patients presenting with presenting symptoms of COVID-19, to manage hospital cap capacity, ensure the safety of visitors and inform clinical decision making. Rapid antigen tests will also be used as a point of arrival test in the self-isolation pilots that will take place in Auckland and Christchurch from the end of this month and into December. The Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment is working closely with businesses and the Ministry of Health to support businesses to accelerate additional levels of testing for their workforce. I can announce today that we're working closely with the private sector on a plan to bring rapid antigen tests into the country so businesses can use it in a way that will work best in New Zealand's COVID-19 environment. I've been in talks with business leaders who are eager to use this technology to protect their workforce, and tomorrow I'll meet with a group of them, as well as fellow ministers and officials, to discuss the next steps for safely incorporating rapid antigen testing into our COVID-19 response to boost public health protections. I want to be clear that while this technology provides a result quickly, Rapid antigen tests tend to be less sensitive at detecting cases, especially in asymptomatic people, or those who are either very early in or towards the end of their infectious period. When I worked as an infectious diseases doctor in Singapore, it wasn't uncommon that I'd review patients whose diagnosis of dengue was missed because the treating doctor relied too heavily on a false negative rapid test. That's why we must ensure a system is in place so that we don't miss cases and any positive cases must then be linked with healthcare and managed appropriately. Developing these systems will be the work businesses and government will design together. I'll now hand over to Professor Murdoch to talk about his review of COVID-19 testing. Thank you, Minister, and uh, kia ora koutou. Um, the COVID-19 testing technical advisory group was established only a month or so ago, and our first task has been to undertake a rapid review of COVID-19 testing across the country. The focus of the review has been on the systems and processes uh, by which testing activities are coordinated within New Zealand and on how new tests and testing innovations um, are assessed and adopted. And I want to acknowledge at this stage the other members of the group who have worked very hard on this report. The main purpose of our review was to ensure that COVID-19 testing is agile and fit for purpose in supporting New Zealand's pandemic response. As Minister Verrill indicated, we are moving from a time when we need to totally rely on tests with very high sensitivity, the PCR tests. Although PCR will continue to be the main test, uh, testing method that we use, we need to look at other testing options to complement PCR. Uh, we also need to keep abreast of new developments, uh, both in terms of tests and how they're used, and the developments in this area are moving very, very quickly. And, as is common uh, at a time of major crises, um, during this pandemic, we've seen a, a very uh, rapid movement in technological developments. And uh, we can expect many new exciting innovations in the, in the testing space. And those of us who work within it are very hopeful that we're gonna have quite a lot of advancement in diagnostics and actually not just for COVID. I would also um, echo uh, Minister's comments. Um, the panel were very, keen to acknowledge the huge contribution that laboratory staff and all of those other staff supporting testing throughout the country have had in the pandemic response. I mean, these have been some of the hidden heroes and the testing, of course, underpins virtually every aspect of the response. But uh, New Zealanders can be well assured that we have excellent laboratory services in this country. The other findings from our report can really be mainly grouped into three themes. Uh, the first is that we need to be faster and more agile in assessing and implementing new tests and testing approaches. Uh, as a country, we were too slow to adopt saliva testing, 
and, to pre and slow to prepare for rapid antigen testing. So we do need to up our game here. We need a clearly articulated process for how tests are regulated and funded. We need uh, ongoing assessment of new tests and testing approaches and to look overseas as part of that and uh, gain from experience from overseas. We need to be piloting new tests and testing approaches too just to assess how well they'll work in the New Zealand context and that's, that's really quite important. What was also obvious to the group was the need to better connect with communities and innovators within those communities. And that's not just the business community, that's with Māori, Pacific, rural and other communities. As we know, one size doesn't fit all for, for many parts of this response and it's really critical that we work with communities to co-design and implement testing strategies that are fit for purpose. So it's about innovation as well as access, uh, equity of access. The third theme is around uh, allowing the laboratories to be best prepared for the future. As I say, we've got excellent laboratories, but they're very keen to get information so they can plan. So uh, we need to make sure they get the information they need about the testing strategy and the pandemic plan and what changes may be occurring so that they can plan for the future in terms of their um, workforce, in terms of their suppliers and reagents. And also with regard to workforce, uh, you know, as well as we've heard about doctors uh, and the need to get doctors into the country, certainly lab staff as well, there's an issue with retention and recruitment and if it's directed toward that, it would be uh, very important. So ultimately, uh, we need to have a robust system to ensure that we have the right tests in the right place for the right people and that our laboratories are best prepared. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Professor Murdoch. In summary, as the Prime Minister has said, a highly vaccinated population opens doors. It means COVID-19 will be less threatening and less scary illness. That's good news. It might also mean that people's behaviour around testing will change. So now is the time to bring in new tools into our toolkit, for example, by using new tests in new settings. To be clear, PCR is likely to remain the mainstay of our testing plan, but greater use of rapid antigen testing is another marker in our progress to reconnect with the world. We want to continue to actively control any COVID-19 outbreak now and in the future. And our public health teams are contact tracing and testing as extensively as ever. And the more New Zealanders who are vaccinated, the greater we can protect each other from the virus. We need everyone to do their bit, so please get vaccinated. I'm happy to take questions. Just, 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 just hot on this. Um, in the past, the government hasn't been too hot on this kind of testing. As I said, one of the important things to note here is that we're shifting into a different environment with a highly vaccinated population. And that means that we have new opportunities. The risks of missing one single case once we're all vaccinated is substantially lower. In addition, uh, we um, haven't been in the position that other countries have been with high prevalence of COVID-19, which is when rapid antigens test our tests perform best. So now is a good opportunity to make these changes. To include us from preparing for these things and just picking up on Professor Murdoch's point about needing to be faster and more agile, too slow with saliva testing, too slow to set up for rapid antigen, only setting up the technical advisory group a month ago. So why didn't you prepare better for this? Yeah, we've sought this advice because we want to make the most of these opportunities. And I think, um, I'll ask Professor Murdoch his view too, there is a... Um, there is a conservatism that comes from the um, idea that there is such a high risk attached to missing one single case. So one of the things we want to do is to start to unlock that and allow some of these new innovations to come through. David. No, I agree. I think, um, you know, naturally that with the elim elimination strategy, we were focused on, and that was the right strategy, we were focused on the best tests. And I think that did lead to degree of conservatism, which is uh, an explanation, not a justification, but it was certainly deserved to focus on the best tests at the time. Why could we have better prepared for, for the eventuality of moving out of the elimination strategy, which we've done as of, as of Monday, could we have been better prepared in terms of saliva testing and rapid antigen so we could be rolling it out en masse now? I think we could have been better prepared, yes. So you, it was just a couple of weeks ago on Twitter that you were rubbishing Chris Bishop's calls for rapid antigen testing to be rolled out. Yeah, he was talking about a, sharing a particular um, 
uh, um, piece of research. That's from the United States where they have um, very, very limited public health controls in place, high levels of COVID in the community. In that sort of setting, uh, the researcher he was citing has modelled that you might be able to fl flatten the curve a little by using access to rapid antigen tests at home. That is not the situation that we're in. And what we're exploring is quite strategic uses of them in particular settings. Yeah, I'm just saying saying that right now that we're highly vaccinated, that we, there is a role for this test. But, I mean, we're only 50% fully vaccinated. Uh, so we're, we're starting to use it in more and more settings. We are not at the stage at all, and that's clear in my rem remarks, where we're using it as a replacement for PCR or anything like that at all. Minister, but, just to follow up on Toby's question, we were always going to hit this pivot point where we went from within the country went from elimination to some sort of reopening plan. I mean, why wasn't this done months ago so that so that so that you know, like the, the processes and everything were ready to go? Yeah, I think to be fair, there is a large amount of innovation in our testing space. So for example, rapid antigen tests are already being used, as I outlined, in Auckland hospitals. Uh, there are saliva tests in use. We have been using wastewater testing. We have been using whole genome sequencing. And we have a large uh, capacity and excellent network of laboratories providing PCR testing. There is a point where we need to change, and we're making that change as our vaccination rates go up. Has the government been dragged no, no, no. kicking and screaming to, to this? I mean, you had to, oh, okay, sorry. Um, you've had to wait for this report to get, basically give you the hurry up. Why I mean, have you been doing this? Is this reluctant? Uh, absolutely not. We've asked for this report in order to be able to unlock the power of innovation in this space. Yeah. Just to get some more detail on what this pilot will actually entail, how large is it going to be? Are there specific sectors that you're going to be focusing on? How long will that pilot take place? Yeah, we want to work with uh, businesses, that, uh, non businesses that run non-clinical services and who have uh, workplace or workplaces or workforces that uh, need to be out and about. So, for example, people who, who can't work from home. And, uh, you know, we're designing this pilot in conjunction with industry. So we'll work through uh, exactly how, um, how it'll take shape together. Uh, just, just, on back, just on the back of that question, um, when will... What are some of the time frames around this? Kick off meeting with me tomorrow. So who are you meeting tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow we're meeting with a group of uh, with Rob Fife, Adrian Littlewood, uh, and some other business representatives, um, including uh, some from primary primary industries and other um, mostly multinational companies. Many of whom have um, have uh, operate overseas and have had experience. One of the things we want to get is the benefit of their experiences from overseas. Sort of industries. Um, do you think we'll see this rolled out in first? Yeah, as I said, we want to design this together, and those will be some of the um, some of the things that we we work through. Professor Murdoch, you're um, you're uh, you've obviously delivered the report today. You've got to make other work. What is your role now in the coming weeks and months? I chair the COVID testing technical advisory group. So we are we are a Ministry of Health uh, group and we provide advice, technical advice, to the Ministry. So, so will you be uh, providing further advice as there are branches of, of research, or you'll be kind of checking in and saying, hang on, why aren't we doing this? We could be doing this better. Is there, I mean, is your role partly accountability and partly advice to... I'm Ministry expecting this, both. Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you see a role Dina, for the New South understands that the Drug Detection Agency has applied to the Ministry of Health to import and use two types of rapid antigen tests. Is it likely that that application will be approved? Uh, sorry, Gina, can you please repeat your, your question? We understand that the Drug Detection Agency has applied to import uh, to and use two types of rapid antigen tests. Is it likely that that, uh, that application will be approved? I'm not aware of that application, and I'm not aware of who that Drug Detection Agency would be. It's not one of the um, members of industry I've been corresponding with. And the 25 businesses that are seeking emergency clearance to import the 370,000 tests this week, will you approve that? Uh, we're going to work together on a system that will make sure that the objectives business uh, have can be can be met alongside the public health objectives that we also have as government. Are you very aware that those businesses are concerned to start surveilling their workforces right now. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, I understand that concern 
and that's what we'll be working through together. But we do need to give that process a chance to. The regulatory process um, is a decision by the Director General. He will seek technical advice as part of making that decision. But that isn't, that isn't the only issue involved in how we do this. We also want to make sure that any positive cases identified are linked into the health system. So we just want to take the time to be able to uh, make sure those processes are in place. It's not going to happen this week. Uh, we've set up a uh, what's called a design sprint to make sure that we are across all the different areas of importation, procurement, uh, and the public health processes. Uh, it's called sprint. Yes. So, are you expecting this pilot to be completed till by the end of the year? Because you know most of the population will be vaccinated. Fingers crossed. And also, at the start of next year, you'll be looking at opening up the border. So, arguably, you'd want this fully implemented and not just a pilot, is it, is, when will it be completed? Yeah, so we'll be doing this in a, um, a what's called a, a design sprint where we can rapidly uh, try new methods um, and uh, learn from them and adapt as we as we go. I think there'll be progress on the ground within a month. Is it likely Professor, do you think there's any merit in using rapid antigen testing? Professor, do you think there's any merit in having in rapid antigen testing as part of the surveillance testing um, in a community outbreak? There will certainly be roles, and I think it, uh, and that's to be worked through, but absolutely there will be uh, roles. I mean, ultimately we'll be looking at protecting, uh, uh, protecting vulnerable populations, uh, protecting essential workers, keeping caps on outbreaks, so there will be a role. When you say that we think we, you think we could have been better prepared, and in light of your view that it has merit in community surveillance, then is it a bit of a missed opportunity that we haven't been able to do that for this outbreak? Um, I'm unsure about that. Um, I think there is, uh, we have actually done really well with our PCR testing in terms of there is really good capacity at the moment. It's been tested. Have we been using that capacity? Happy with the way we've been using that capacity? At the beginning of the outbreak, we had those massive long lines at testing stations. We had capacity in the country to do thousands of saliva tests a day, and we weren't doing that. Yeah, there was certainly the system was strained at the start, as it was everywhere in the world. So the system wasn't being used entirely as well. Is that also? Sorry, the system that. wasn't also being used to its full capacity, isn't that? Yeah, um, I should say that there certainly have been times, many times during the pandemic, that the lab services have been absolutely stretched. But also, I should say, they've done remarkably well with our PCR testing. Is it likely that rapid antigen testing will be used um, pre-flight for either international or domestic uh, flights in the future? Uh, that is one of the um, options being looked at. I know we're receiving some modelling on the role of rapid antigen tests as a pathway, um, which will include uh, potentially shortened MIQ, uh, potentially uh, in combination with PCR tests. So Can I also ask, just, just to take you back to earlier this week, when the government made the decision to lessen restrictions in Auckland, despite there being ongoing community transmission, as a health professional, did that decision, knowing there would be more cases, did that decision churn your stomach a bit? I think the um, issue that uh, I thought through for that decision was that with um, our level three and four, uh, the most um, uh, one of the some of the most stringent restrictions in the world, and we had used level three and four um, with the original uh, variant for short periods of time but we were increasingly asking people to stay at these globally very high levels of restrictions for a prolonged period of time, and that has other consequences. Can I also throw that question in a different light to, to Professor Murdoch? I mean, do you think the genie's out of the bottle now in terms of infections in the community, and do you agree with Michael Plank that it's only a matter of time before COVID-19 spreads to all corners of New Zealand? Sorry, I'll need to get you to repeat that. I didn't quite catch the beginning. Do, do you agree that the, so the, the genie's out of the bottle now in terms of infections around the country and, and agree with Michael Plank in saying that, that it's only a matter of time before it spreads to different corners of New Zealand? I think I, it's certainly... Um, yeah, I mean, we're certainly at a different stage now and it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult to control. So, yes, broadly, I would agree with that. I mean, saying everywhere, inevitably, well, I'm not sure about that, but certainly it's going to be uh, difficult to control at this stage. I think just a point I'd make in addition to that is that there is a, with vaccination, we can disconnect infection from disease and death. And that's, that's the opportunity that we have. So transmission 
um, in, in countries with high rates of vaccination, for example, Singapore, where I think 88% of their total, or 83% of their total population is vaccinated, more than 90% of their cases either have no or extremely mild symptoms. So COVID can change if we have high rates of vaccination. Matt. Would you go to the line though? The Ministry of Health devising a new testing strategy. Do you have a timeline on when that might be ready for release and then ready to start being implemented? I'm uh, afraid I don't have a timeline, but I know it is one of the priority pieces of work in the Ministry at the moment. One of the other recommendations from the, uh, from the report released today uh, looks at um, pay for lab techs and lab staff who are having to do you know, quite a lot of work in, in, in the past 18 months. Is that something the government Um, I believe most laboratory technicians are employed by either private companies, uh, though they and many are unionised. Uh, a small minority, for example, the lab that Professor Murdoch works in, is still owned by the district health boards. Uh, as a, just as coming back, health, uh, as, a, as a public health expert who was uh, involved in the creation of New Zealand's elimination strategy, uh, can you just help shed some light? There's been some. Um, conflicting statements about whether we are moving away from elimination. In your view, is that, are we moving away from elimination and what are we moving to in our, in our current strategy right now? I think the important thing about the strategy is um, it's not an end in itself. It's a way of achieving your aims. And our aims are to protect people's lives and our way of life. And that hasn't changed. But what has changed is the availability of vaccines. And that means that COVID doesn't have to be a serious disease uh, for most people uh, like it was previously. And that uh, does allow us to evolve our approach as we're doing. So we're not doing elimination anymore? Uh, no, we are able to look at more options now. And I want to make it very clear that um, we continue to use all our tools, uh, particularly contact tracing, testing, case isolation, incredibly um, uh, with um, uh, vigorously in um, in the affected communities. I'm going to take two more questions because we're past two. Yes. There have been calls alongside mandating uh, vaccinations for uh, teachers to also regularly test them. I know there's pilots for the private sector, but is there any capacity for perhaps like rapid antigen testing of teachers, ECE staff, especially while those young children can't get vaccinated? Um, the announcement today is, is about, um, uh, is about uh, particular parts of industry, but we are aware of other settings and are seeking further advice on them. You know. oh, can I just ask Professor Murdoch, when you say we've been too slow on the saliva testing, too slow on the rapid antigen testing, who do you put that down to? Do you put that down to the Ministry of Health? Look, I, I, can, I actually don't know. I mean, I think but I'll go back to my comment before about the, the focus on elimination and having the best test. And I think that did drive a certain conservatism and, and you know, partly justifiable on the best test. And, you know, we're looking back, yes, we, 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 we probably missed a few opportunities just to get things up and running. Yes, so we know yeah, last question, that since the beginning of this year, there's been a saliva test that's equally yeah. accurate to uh, the PCR test conducted by APHG. That provider was stopped from by the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. providing free services to Māori Pacific communities in Pororua back in March. How can you possibly not see that the Ministry of Health is an issue here? Yeah. Well, I'll comment. But, I mean, I agree. That was too slow. I think the adoption of saliva testing, there has been evidence around for quite a while of well, equivalence. Do you or the Minister any confidence that the Ministry of Health is capable of, of even conducting a sprint? Uh, so we are um, doing that as a... Um, uh, with the officials at the Ministry of, of Health who have, are doing an excellent job in responding to the pandemic and running the largest medical event in our country, the uh, country's history, the vaccination campaign. But we'll be doing that in conjunction with um, uh, one of our officials that assists me in my other portfolio in research, science and innovation, uh, and they'll bring in uh, both the business and some of the expertise in um, the, the design processes. In the yeah, future, sorry, thank you, um, right. just in the future, do you last, have... Last question. Um, just a quick question on contact tracing and capacity. Um, so the Ministry of Health has said that it could uh, contact, it could work with 1,000 new cases a day and 6,000 contacts. That's about sort of six per person. Is that quite low? And if, if since, uh, since PHU is pretty well staffed now, um, why did Auckland need to sort of lean on other 
catchers for support? Uh, that is always the um, plan for the one of the layers of escalation that we built into uh, into the contact tracing system is that that work gets devolved in the particularly the tr clinically tricky contacts gets devolved to other public health units with some of the simpler um, contacts, for example, ident low risk identified at locations of interest going to um, call centre staff. So that's how we um, manage the demand during high demand periods. So right. just in the, in the future, Last one. Th thank you. Um, I'm just um, a bit perplexed as to the, the way the system is being reviewed, kind of from within. Um, I wonder whether in the future the report could be released to media more than a half an hour before a press conference, and whether perhaps the report writer could do uh, a media briefing separately to the official government briefing, so there's a bit of independence, I guess, with, with the person checking the system. Uh, Thank you for that feedback. I'm very happy to take that on board for next time. And I think one of the um, points to um, Professor Murdoch's uh, committee was um, convened and uh, commissioned by the Ministry of Health. Uh, they did have a link with um, Ian Town being one of the um, uh, one of the officials who works closely and usually attends their meeting. For the purpose of this report, um, Dr. Town was not involved in that in that review. Thank you very much.